So 19 recommendations, uh, and we could spend hours going on through all of them, of course, and the details on that. But uh, let's look at a, get a few specific ones and uh, talk a little bit about those. I know technology has been a big component in general lately. Uh, it's been talked about by a number of organizations. Uh, a number of states have been enacting uh, efforts to change or implement technology and try to work with that in preventing impaired driving. What, does, what did NTSB do about uh, technology issues? Yeah, and, and you know, thank you for actually highlighting that because there are 19. Um, they really fit into stronger laws, swifter enforcement, and really pushing the use of technology. So in the technology area, there were really two specific areas we tried to focus on. And I kind of consider a lot of these, what can we do now, and what are the things that will take a while for us to really get the benefits. And so on the what can we do now, the NTSB made a recommendation to use ignition interlocks for all first-time offenders. So there's a lot to that because we're talking about some states that don't have anything at all, programs that are still needed. And complementing that was a recommendation for the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration to provide guidelines on what an optimal ignition interlock program could be. Because we know, for example, that only 25% of the ignition interlocks that are prescribed actually get on the car. So, again, the form was about data. Data show that when an inter ignition interlock is on, it reduces recidivism, and it also helps with crash, fatal crashes. But if it's not on there, then you're not getting the benefit. And so with only one quarter of the people putting it on that are supposed to be putting it on, that's a significant number of concern, number of the people that are not following through. We want 100%. Yeah. You want every one of those people lowering the risk. And if only 25% are putting it on, that's a problem. And again, that's a problem from everything from what program do we put in place that's going to be effective to uh, you know, the technology piece, just to the fact that every first offender should get it. With ignition interlocks, there's a lot of people out there that think this is you know, magic, it's, it's not science, it doesn't work, not reliable. What do you say about that? It's kind of like the myth that somehow we've solved the problem of drunk driving. It ends up ignition interlocks, a great piece of technology now, and it's evolved tremendously. And so there's a lot of different safeguards on there. So the concern about you know who's actually doing the breath test and can you identify that's the right face that needs to be there. There's all these new pieces of either program, process, or technology, like facial recognition even, mm -hmm. that helps to make sure the right person is doing the test. They're extremely effective when they're actually being used. Well, in fact, once they're in the car, and a person's driving, and I understand it could have an, it can require a test even at that point in time. Yes, that's called a rolling test, for example. So, you know, one of the concerns is, well, someone can blow into it and get the car started, but then the person that you're really worried about is who's driving. That's what a rolling test does. It actually makes them blow into it again. And again, these could be random. They're not prepared for it, and they've got to be ready and not, you know, if they don't pass, then the car's not going to go. It's going to be an issue. Regarding uh, ignition relax as well. Uh, so there's the face recognition, the, the blowing and the rolling test. Are there other uh, safety measures, so to speak, or techniques or devices that can make sure it's working properly? The, uh, how the ignition interlock is working? Yes. Uh, there's all kinds of things that are built in, which frankly go from just the, um, the sound, whether it's a hum. I mean, there's certain ways you have to blow into it and know that you're doing it, that it's working. Um, and, and that's why I say I think the the main point is it's extremely effective when it's on the car, so 25% is not acceptable. And, and the other part is the concern that somehow you can trick it. You know, there's probably still ways creative people are getting around it, but the reality is nowadays technology and the procedures really minimize that. And if you have everybody on it, one or two people getting around it versus thousands that are on it, the numbers still say we're getting safer. You know, and thank you for bringing that up because I think that's a general issue. Very often people talk about, oh, there's a way you're going to get around that. Or we can't find everybody who's out there drinking and driving. So we don't need a law. We don't need to do this. And I think that's backwards. Just because there might be a challenge of enforcement or making sure people are using the technology correctly, etc., you can't let that stop you from having some effective measure that's going to make a difference in reducing crashes, lives lost, and injuries. You've got to pursue those. Now, one of the other issues with ignition airlock, and this ties in, and actually with what you just said, it deals with alcohol, not drugs. So how do we, I mean, why do it if it just deals with alcohol? 
And this is a really important point because we've had alcohol impaired driving on our most wanted list and then in 2012, 2013, um, so in 2012 we had alcohol impaired driving on our most wanted list and then 2013 it evolved to substance impaired driving and what that did was acknowledge the role now that drugs play in impaired driving and the challenge is, there are two parts about this, the challenge is the drug piece is very hard right now mm -hmm. to assess it, you're looking over the counter, you're looking at prescription, you're looking at illegal, it's just a very difficult area. Um, but the other part we know is there's a very high percentage of people that are using both. And so, again, we don't want to not do one because somebody might be on the drug side and not, well, the reality is you have to do the alcohol. It's still too big of an issue, and there's a lot of people that are doing both, both the alcohol and some other kind of drug.